Well, thank you, Steve. This one's for you, Doug. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Happy birthday to God. <laughs> oh, it is wonderful to see all of you. Didn't I just see all of you five days ago, a few days ago? <laughs> I'm glad we could come back together here on the weekly Sabbath. And again, welcome to those online. So glad you could join us as well. All right, make sure I'm good. Thank you for as I'm getting myself ready up here. Well, it is an exciting day. It's, a, it's a looking forward to what's going to happen here in just a few hours. And I prayed about that and I thought about that, and you know, it's always God's will and His direction when a message comes forth. And as we sit here on the weekly Sabbath, and as Steve mentioned, it's the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. Here we are. And it's the Sabbath. So tomorrow, the morrow after the Sabbath, is the wave sheaf offering. And I, as he also mentioned, we start day one tomorrow of counting towards Pentecost. And I actually thought about talking about Pentecost, and I prayed about it. Maybe I'll wait for that and save that for the countdown on Monday. But I wanted to revisit, and I prayed about it, revisit a message that I gave almost 12 years ago. Talking about time flying, right? Time flying. And a couple of you are in the room today that possibly heard that message. I gave it up in Elkhart almost 12 years ago. I thought it would be appropriate to revisit that topic today as we look forward, again, as I said, to the activities that will be happening later today. I gave this, the original message was given on June 30th, 2012. And although I went through and I tweaked it a little bit, it is still relevant today. Back then, I brought up a fact. If you don't know, June 30th is our wedding anniversary, Karen and mine wedding anniversary. And that, on that Sabbath, I made the journey. I don't know if Josh came with me, but they couldn't, she didn't, couldn't join me that day. She had just had surgery tonsil removal surgery and I joked with her before I came down I said you know what you just had your appendix taken out three years earlier you're not the same woman I married <laughs> and at that time it was our sixth wedding anniversary and now as we approach June 30th this year if my math is correct it's 18 right yeah, 12 plus 6 is 18. So I do have my notes that on that day I waved to you through the camera and I said happy anniversary to you. And we all know that marriage is a huge step in life. It is one of the many things in life where the memories of the event and even leading up to the event can be recalled with great focus and emotion. And I have in my notes that I mentioned that this past week, not this week, but back then, 12 years ago, I thought about our wedding ceremony, and I still can think, you know, obviously, most of us, all of us who've been married can think back to that ceremony. And the joy that came from the pomp and circumstance of that day. It is also a great reminder of how serious a commitment marriage is and what it takes to keep that marriage going through the years. And this is a... I have it titled today, Com Commitment Revisited. Usually I don't share my titles, but um, the name of the original was Commitment, and I just figured we'll just put the word revisited after the word commitment today. Because now we're going to talk several ways of commitment. But first is marriage. Back then, 12 years ago, the week before... And I remember this day very well. We were outside in the backyard, Karen and I. We were putting together a wooden swing for our girls. And that wooden swing still stands today. Although they've grown and they don't use it anymore. Sorry if I get emotional. It is used. We use it for wind chimes and other things. And that still stands. It's older, obviously. Wearing out a little bit. But it still stands. And I remember a comment that she made when we were, we were putting this together. 
And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not the most mechanically inclined individual on the face of the earth. I'm learning, I'm growing how to be mechanically inclined. That was quite a job. Earlier that week, on that same day, I think it was a Tuesday I have in my notes. It was a Tuesday of that week. Earlier in that day, I had gone and helped my other brother. Some of you know my brother Josh. I actually have a, another brother, the one in the middle between myself and Josh. I went over to his house and had, helped him put the same swing set, same type together with him, up for him and his, his children. So I came home. And I thought, all right, I already put one up. What's another one in a day, right? She could see, and I'm talking about Karen, I was getting frustrated with a couple of the bolts, screws, and whatever else was there. And I do, and this is why this quote's in here, because I remember this quote to this day. She said, putting together this swing set with you is like our marriage. It is hard work to do. Some of it goes together easy, and some of it's hard. But in the end, it's all worth it. I remember that quote, even 12 years later. That's where the word commitment came from in my mind. I was thinking about that when she said that in that day. It takes commitment to see something through, whatever that is. Putting together a swing set. Getting a diploma. You have an assignment at the workplace that's important. Whatever it is. And we bring it back to marriage. Raising kids, making the choice to have kids. Raising kids... Whatever it is, it's commitment. It takes commitment to get things done. Commitment is defined as giving a pledge or promise, making a binding agreement, or obligating oneself towards something and or to entrust for safekeeping. When we think about what we do when we make a commitment, it usually involves some type of work on our part to see it through. Whether a big commitment or a little commitment, it takes work on our part to get it done. On that day, over 12 years ago, well, about 12 years ago, I made a commitment to get that swing set done for my children. And my wife made a commitment to help me with that swing set, and we got it done. It took work to get that done. It was not a one-person job. I'm very thankful that she came out. I should have known better because I had helped my brother earlier. Going back to Karen's statement and what a profound statement it was, and thinking back at putting together that swing set, there was, when we put it together, there was giving and taking. You had to know, was this person going to move the wood piece this way? Where are you at? It's got, sometimes you also got to be a mind reader. I try to be a mind reader. I know it's, you know, or look ahead to, be, to focus and to see the situation. To see where the person needs to be. Do I need to be on this side to hold up the piece? We were working together for a common goal that day, which she likened to our marriage. And at that time, I made sure I wrote this down, and I remember saying this too. And these words came out of my mouth. was, our marriage is a lot easier than putting this thing together. If you would turn to a Colossians, please, chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians 3, verse 18. Paul, we're going to go through a few scriptures about Paul and what he said about marriage, husbands and wives, and that's going to lead us into another form of commitment. Colossians 3, verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. It's a team. It's teamwork. And in Ephesians 5... Ephesians 5... Verse 22, Paul writes and says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, 
and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands. See, that's not just a one-way thing. It's not just one way that wives submit. No, no, no. It's a relationship. It's respect on both ends. Because he says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And then this past week, we have been reminded of that sacrifice that Christ has done for his church, the body of Christ, with the Passover and the renewing of the commitment to Christ and to the Father. To be reminded of what our Savior did for us. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. See, now we're going to make that transition to a different type of commitment that we've been called to, that we've chosen to make. Just like with a wedding, we chose, Karen and I chose to get married to each other. We made that choice. And we're still working on it. We're still doing the things. And there's a still been ups and downs. But he says, just as Christ. In verse 28, verse 5, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church, the body of Christ. That's what our Savior has done, continues to do with his sacrifice and his resurrection. And now he is our defender in front of the Father, the right hand of God, preparing ourselves, preparing us, getting us ready, telling us to be ready for that wedding day to come. It says in verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his, to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's dual. It's teamwork. These scriptures show the duality of the relationship that we need to have with Jesus Christ. Two beings working together to reach a common goal. In a marriage, a common goal is to have, you know, longevity to it, to have a household that gets things done, among other things. In our relationship with Jesus Christ, what's the goal? To make it to the kingdom. And they want... He wants us to succeed. We just heard that. What Steve said in his announcements. God wants us to be successful. He wants all, everyone to make it. They are willing to work with us if we've been called and we've made the choice to commit to them. Each one of us has made a commitment to be here today on the Sabbath day. We committed to be here on the first day of unleavened bread. God willing, we will commit and be here on the last day of unleavened bread. We commit to what he tells us to do. We have pledged to Jesus Christ and the Father that we would show up to listen and talk about his word and truth. For those of us that have been baptized and those about ready to be, we have really made a commitment to God. And you thought 12 years have gone by. It's been 25 years since I was baptized. February 13th, 1999. And there's been ups, and there's been downs, and there's been struggles, and there's been victories. And being baptized, although I love my wife and I love my family, 
being baptized is the one event that is greater than getting married. Through baptism and the laying on of hands, we have promised and made the commitment to live each day the way that God instructs us to live life through his word. And by the laying on of hands, God has made a promise to give a little bit of himself to us. By through the Holy Spirit. We have given over our lives to him and strive to allow him to work through us. Please turn to Romans 6. Romans 6 verse 1 states, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's the importance of that event, that ceremony of baptism. When you go completely underwater, it's as if you died. And you get, we, you get brought back up in newness of life. It's a symbol of showing that we put to death the old way. And we're going to live, un, live new, anew with Christ in this journey that we have on this, this planet. It says in verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And that's not easy. We still sin. I've sinned since 25 years ago. We've all sinned. It's, a, it's, it's hard work, working together with Jesus and being committed to both him and the Father, just like a marriage. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, and we went over on the first day of unleavened bread, he died to sin once for all, but that the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the whole symbolic nature in the ceremony of baptism. It's very important. Very important. Count the cost, he tells us. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, but you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We still need to follow the law. The law is still in effect. The law points us to sin, shows us what sin is. But the law can't save us. Scripture is very clear. It's the grace, it's the love of Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and shed His blood. So, But we have to make that commitment that, yes, we're going to live the life that you tell us to live. Make the commitment to walk the path that you've told us to walk now. Because Paul says in verse 15, What then shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace. And he shuts that down real quick. says, Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave, whom, slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? So that commitment to God is obedience to the best of our ability to strive. Again, mistakes are made. We're still human. 
I've said that many times in messages. Yep, you can pinch yourself. It hurts. We're still human. We have those who are baptized, have the little bit of the Holy Spirit in us, but we still can make mistakes. We can still choose to turn our back. He says, obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Paul then continues, says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness... So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. And you could do whatever you wanted. No, you know, in our minds, before baptism and before we knew the truth, we ran around and did whatever we thought we could do. Whatever that was. 21. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and in the end, everlasting life. That's the gift. That's the gift from on high. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians six, verse nineteen. Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God, and you are not your own? See, that's what happened at baptism and the laying out of hands. You we became a temple for the Spirit of God. And it's no longer us. And we are not our own anymore. Because it says in verse 20, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That commitment. Once baptized and hands laid upon us, and we've repented of our sins, we've made that choice. Nobody, nobody strong-armed me. Nobody strong-armed any of you. Nobody's strong-arming anybody about that. It's a choice that we can make and that we've made. Have that commitment to the Father to strive to do our best with his spirit in us, to let him work in us, to guide us, to direct our paths. And after 25 years of that, it, yeah, I know, it takes hard work. And many of you, maybe longer. Those online, maybe longer. I don't know. It takes hard work to stay committed to God. As I said, even just like a marriage, there's ups, there's downs, there's struggles, there's victories. Why? Because we lose focus. See, in a marriage, a human marriage, both parties could lose focus. In this commitment, God doesn't lose focus. God promises to be there. It's when we falter and we lose focus. We can face many trials, and we have. I've faced many trials. My wife's faced many trials. Many of you have faced many trials of different sizes, and at times, and lengths of those. And sometimes, the roughest trials can bring us to our knees. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. For, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. He's talking about that spirit, that Holy Spirit in us, in this earthen vessel, in this body. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, 
knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread to the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And we have to make sure that the inner man, inner person, being that spirit is being renewed day by day. A great example is there. Here we are in the days of unleavened bread. We don't have to do it every day of the year, but he commands us seven days out of the year to eat unleavened bread every day to picture putting Christ in us as a reminder that we cannot do it alone, that we have help, but we have to do it their way, their way, putting Christ in us to think about that. How are we going to overcome with Christ? It says in verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And in chapter 5, verse 1, For we know that of our earthly house this tent is destroyed, this body. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That our Savior will bring that reward with him. Whether we pass away before his return or if we're there at that time and we hear, we hear that last trump changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. That down payment, that's what that means, that guarantees that down payment. Hands laid upon us after baptism, Spirit, God, God welcomes that, God grants that. He says, that one is mine. They have the down payment of what's to come. Only if we stay committed. Only if we strive. Only if we come before them in humbleness when we do make mistakes and say, please forgive me through Jesus Christ. What we've been called to do is so important to live the life that we've chosen to listen to that call and walk the path is so important. But if we do get brought to our knees, then what shall we do but pray? Prayer. Come to them before their throne, before the Father's throne with our Savior at his right hand. Ask for strength. Ask for guidance. Ask for forgiveness to continue and to persevere. Philippians chapter 4 <clears throat> Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Then Paul reminds the church of Philippi, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And if we turn to Hebrews, it 
in Hebrews. Go to chapter 4. And in Hebrews 4, making the connection between when Joshua took them over into the promised land to what we're facing and what our job and our goal is. Verse 9, Hebrews 4, verse 9, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And Paul's talking about that disobedience from the Israelites not wanting to go in the promised land the first time. And they had to go wander for 40 years, and that first that first generation had to die in the wilderness. Diligent to the commitment that, we're, that is made. It says in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hold fast. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Come to the throne in prayer, meditation. Come before and ask for help. That helps in our commitment when we're walking with God. It helps in a marriage, too. <laughs> to come and ask prayer to guide and to help. To see what we can do to be better for the commitment. Colossians 1. And in that commitment, in that journey, Paul writes to the church in Colossae, chapter 1, verse 9, for, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not, cease, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So there's another way of saying the goal, the inheritance that awaits us. It's also a reminder for those of us who have been baptized. Never, ever forget the miracle that happened to call us out of this world. <coughs> Never, ever forget that. It's a message to myself, too. We cannot forget it. a miracle. He didn't have to call us. He told Moses, I could call rocks and raise up rocks to do my work. He looked down and saw something. touched our minds and opened our minds to his truth, his way, and invited us to make a choice. In verse 13, he says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In Colossians 2, verse 6, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. I don't know if that's saying, no, nope, that's picture. I had a smile when that first slide was up there and I saw that scripture. I, I don't talk to Steve about my messages. 
And there's that scripture. And I just sat back there and I smiled to myself. And I said, thank you to God for guiding because that only happens by his will and his way when that stuff happens. Rooted and built up in him. That's part of the commitment, to stay rooted in him, in Christ. And through Christ, the Father. And that's what he's telling the church in Colossae. Then he says in Colossians 4, verse 2, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. As I said earlier, if we get knocked down on our knees, we'll then stay down there and pray. It's okay to be humbled. It's okay for that to happen. And then to also, to also recognize that we're down there, then we pray and ask for help and guidance to continue the journey and forgiveness. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Verse, verses 5 and 6. It says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Commit to him. It says in verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. And there's things we all can work on. I read those and I see several things I can continue to work on because no one's perfect. That's part of the commitment. As we did this past week, the Passover, when we recommitted and took the, the wine and the bread for those who have been baptized. And for those that will be baptized, it's something to look forward to next year, to reflect on how did you do this year? What do we need to work on? And we go through that every year. I go through that every year. We all do. doesn't matter how many. 25 years for me, however many each year, when we come to the, the Passover, we take in of the bread and the wine. What can I work on? What, can I, what is still in me? That's why I'm so adamant when it's time for the unleavened bread. I want to flip chairs. I want to flip couches. I get in the car and get that vacuum cleaner going. I need help out here. Come help me. <laughs> in the living room, come help me. I need this. Because it's good practice to look. I know it's just crumbs, but God says leavening represents sin. And to me, when we do that, and we did it as a family, I'm going to say it, I'm proud of my girls this year. I was outside, and they came out. There they come. Where's the vacuum? They're out there vacuuming. I'm like, I stepped I step back. In the commitment that we have to Jesus Christ, that's what we need to do this temple. He says we're a temple. Search, dig down, look. Flip the chairs, the spiritual chairs in our body. Flip the couches. Look. And it's hard to do. Sometimes it's hard to see the hidden sins. But that's what we are asked to do and told to do. To search. To be diligent. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. Verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Commit your works Whatever we do, we have to commit it to the Lord and what he, 
tells us to do. It's dedication. Trust in him. You know, you know, we talked about Paul when he was talking about, in Hebrews, he was talking about look back at the ancient Israelites when they're coming out of Egypt in the wilderness. And many times God told them, why do you keep testing me? And he comes on and says, you've tested me ten times. I'm trying to get you to the promised land. He didn't, that's paraphrasing. But he was. When they're at the Red Sea, he goes, why are you crying? Why are you, just look, he said, go forward. That's what he told them. I'm sure they're looking at, what? There's this big water sea thing in front of us. Go forward? That's what he told them. That's what it says. He told, he told Moses, Moses, tell them to go forward. Then he opened the Red Sea. He wants to help. He's there to help, to guide us. As I said earlier, it's because we lose focus. The commitment that we have with Jesus Christ and through him, the Father, when it falls apart, it's because it's on us. And we need to strive to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on the Father. In 1 Kings 8, 61, this one scripture there. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God to walk in His statutes and keep His commandments as... At this day, let our heart be loyal. Another way of saying committed to God. That's how we prosper. We walk His way, His statutes, His commandments. We come back into reading the Bible, and meditate on his word. Prayer, definitely, obviously. Paul said that, but we need to meditate on the word as well to grow and to learn. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that's true. Our enemy hates the fact that we made the choice once our mind was open to come out of the world. I can't sugarcoat that. Our enemy hates that fact. However, as Steve said earlier, in heaven there's rejoicing much rejoicing when a sinner repents and comes before God through Jesus Christ. And as it was said earlier, and we said it, he wishes none to perish. So the tools are there for us to overcome. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Whose truth? God's truth. His truth, his ways, his commandments, his holy days, his Sabbaths, his truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. Christ's righteousness. Not self-righteousness. His righteousness. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, 
the good news of the soon coming kingdom. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. We have faith that God's word is true, that his promises are true. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. His words that he shared has for us. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. God provides. He provides help and guidance in this commitment. He says, Paul writes back in Romans, Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renewed, transformed, called out of the world, He's there. He helps, he guides with the commitment of following him. Again, this week is another is a good reminder, as I mentioned before, but I want to say it again of the recommitment of becoming better. It's a reminder of how to overcome this world with the help of our Savior. And again, through him, the help of the Father. We're looking forward to that day. We look forward to the marriage supper when Christ returns and he calls upon the body of Christ as his bride. So we made it full circle back to marriage. The duality of it all. The creating of a family. And, you know, time, you don't have time to talk about that, but throughout messages and, and Bible studies, we have talked about that. And we'll continue to talk about that because that's so important. As we come to a close today, today I talked about building a swing set. I talked a little bit about my marriage, a little bit. Talked about baptism over 25 years ago for me. To illustrate a few different aspects of commitment in our lives. We read scripture, God's inspired word, to encourage us to see the facts that he has for us, but to encourage us that we're not alone. And I pray that we all can look at our, ourselves and our lives and see the commitment that we've all pledged to, to both our Father in heaven and to the Savior, Jesus Christ using the physical idea of commitments that we've kind of looked at and talked about to see the hard work. It is hard work. It doesn't happen, you know, overnight. It's hard work. What, what Bruce, Bruce, used to, I remember this first time I heard him speak. He says, God never promised you a rose garden. We do have a garden. It's hard work to keep. There's another example of committing to a garden. We have a garden at home. We're going to start planting here. It's hard work, garden. Make sure it's watered. Make sure you don't get the weeds out. 
It's hard work for a garden. Just thought of that. Garden. But it's commitment to seed. But we're using physical ideas. The hard work, the focus, and the perseverance that's needed to stay the course. To stay on the journey. That's what we want to do. We want to stay committed. Because in Revelation 3... Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The words of our Savior. It's another actually physical example because if we hear that somebody knocking at the door and we don't go answer it, the person's going to walk away. Not think that we're home. We have to get up, do a little work, walk ourselves open to the door and open it up. I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. By working hard, praying always, and overcoming each trial with the help of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Those trials that come our way, we will be able to stand. We will be there. And we have each other. We have each other as well to stand before our Lord and Savior on that day as we prepare ourselves for that marriage supper coming together and the return of Jesus Christ. And then we can look at each other and see it all and say, you know what? It was well worth it. Well worth it to stay committed.